with us. Love to have you join with us. Who can define the qualities of God, right? Who can categorize God? Who can make finite the infinite? He is beyond limits. He is unsearchable and indescribable. God we have and praise will rise from this place this morning where his church his followers his people have gathered praise will rise our joy will rise 
shouts of adoration and worship.
love you and we do worship you. We're so thankful for your goodness and your graciousness. And we can be here and stand in your presence, God. You are so great and filled with love. We give you thanks, God. Amen. Have a seat this morning. Good morning. What a beautiful day it is. Um, I just uh, want to thank uh, all of those who were a part of our slightly adjusted freeze-off carnival no-car show last week. Uh, just uh, put your eyes towards the screens ahead and we'll relive a few of those moments, guys. It was a wonderful evening. If you missed it, well, it'll come back next year. Um, got a call from youth pastor Tony last night. He said, we are in St. George, Utah. It was an uneventful day. To a pastor, that is good news. <laughs> to a former youth pastor, that is great news. <laughs> no issues, no problems. They're there safe. They left early this morning, headed to San Diego to uh, begin their mission trip. So continue in your prayers uh, for them, not just their travels, but that God would use this time in those young people's lives and the staff for his kingdom building, that they would, would meet, reach milestones that would really make a difference in their future lives. Um, I got one other thing, and I'm going to invite Dee to come up and uh, just uh, inform us about an important prayer need. Good morning. Um, a couple of Sundays ago, I gave a report on some of the VOM activities. And today I have an update on one of those that I asked you to pray for. If you remember, I requested prayer for Pastor Andrew, Andrew Brunson, who had a hearing this last Monday in Turkey. The report I have to share is not good. The hearing was convened, but was continued for a third time till October the 12th. And all of those involved were hoping that Pastor Andrew would at least be released until the next hearing. But instead, he has been returned to prison. Um, where he has been for almost two years. His wife, Noreen, said he gave the gospel. He publicly forgave all those who have come against him, forgiving as he has been forgiven. The pastor has become a political pawn for the Turkish government. President Erdogan of Turkey said almost a year ago that a political refugee we have, you have one pastor of ours, 
the pastor we have is on trial. Our pastor is living in the U.S. You give us Mohammed Gulen, then we will try Brunson and give him to you. This 50-year-old pastor is facing 35-year prison sentence for the crime of Christianizing, calling it a crime by the Turkish regime. Bill Koznet, who is in charge of affairs in Turkey, and several U.S. senators have become involved with trying to get Pastor Andrew at least released from prison while waiting for his next hearing. Now we all know that the government doesn't have the power we do as we pray for the resolution to this situation. Pastor Andrew's greatest fear is that he will be forgotten. We must pray without ceasing. Scripture says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are ministered, mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Hebrews 14, 3. And with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Ephesians 6, 18. Please continue to pray for Pastor Andrew and for all those that are in, under attack all over the world. Thank you. Thanks, Dee. <clears throat> Remember, Pastor Andrew Brunson. Ushers, I'm going to invite you forward. We're going to pray for our offerings, but we'll also pray for Pastor Brunson as he continues to hang on. Father God, thank you for reminders how blessed we are that we can worship here freely and, and not worry about uh, being arrested for the simple act of sharing our faith or of living a Christian life. And so we lift up Pastor, Pastor Brunson and ask that uh, you would work in the lives of those, his captors, uh, Lord, that uh, he would be released soon, that you would use our State Department and any other officials to help accomplish that. And Lord, we'll give you the glory. Thank you as well for the opportunity that we have to give back to you, to make it an act of worship, because we know that you are a giver, God. You have blessed us in such wondrous ways. And so we give back to you as an act of worship, thanking you for being there for us. We give you praise in your name. Amen.
seat this morning. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. For he is our God. And we were the people of his pasture. And the sheep of his hand. Father God, we are oh so grateful that you are good. That you are our shepherd. That you've invited us to come and to kneel before you to enjoy your fellowship, to enjoy the nourishment from your hand. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to, to delve into it, to find what you have for us this morning. We praise you, and we look forward to the time together with you and with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Over half a century ago, beginning in the 1950s, our world has asked this question, where have all the leaders gone? Where have all the leaders gone? During that time, society has placed more and more of a premium on leadership, but has found few that exhibit both integrity of heart and skillfulness of hand. At the same time, so ironic, the world abounds with leadership literature, magazines, conferences, and consultants. These products promise fresh ideas, new techniques, and practical principles that help us become more successful in our leadership. Sometimes that advice proves true. But more often than not, they set a set of steps to follow, and catchy cliches that, that leave one more frustrated than refueled, more overwhelmed than liberated. Why all the rhetoric about leadership and the fuss over leadership styles? I'll tell you why. It's because leadership is essential to the success of any organization. Yes, I said any organization, a nation, an army, a sports team, a school, a business, a family, and a church. But what is leadership? Being a bit of a historian, I couldn't resist this one. World War II British Field Marshal Bernard Monty Montgomery said this about leadership. I wish I could do his accent, but I can't. Leadership is the capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose and the character which inspires confidence. That's good. Dr. John R. Mott, who is the founder of the YMCA, gave this definition. A leader is a man or woman who knows the road, who can keep ahead, and who can pull others behind him. Couldn't resist this one either. President Harry S. Truman seemed like a get-her-done kind of guy. Here's what he said. A leader is a person who has the ability to get others to do what they don't want to do and like it. <laughs> oh, man. Let me suggest a much simpler definition. I want to invite you to write this down on your outline if you have one. It's a simple definition. It is this. Leadership is inspiring influence. Leadership is inspiring influence. It's the ability to, to light a fire in, in people's minds and something that motivates them to, to do things that they never ever thought were possible, like rallying an army on the brink of defeat to victory. 
like reviving students who are barely passing their courses to acing their exams, like renewing churches on the brink of implosion to a new sense of mission and spiritual growth. In business, a good leader can stimulate high morale while also increasing profitability. In a family, good leadership can leave a legacy of strong character and a commitment to biblical values. That's what good leaders do. But it's not as easy to describe who leaders are or to prescribe how they got that way. If you were to analyze a a group of leaders, of effective leaders, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find clear similarities on the surface. Temperaments vary greatly among leaders, but one common thread runs through them all. It's this, their ability to get along well with people. Their ability to get along well with people. John D. Rockefeller stated, I will pay more for the ability to deal with people than any other ability under the sun. According to a report by the American Management Association, the overwhelming majority of the 200 managers who participated in this survey agreed that the most important skill of an executive is the ability to get along with people. In the survey, the managers rated the ability to get along more vital than intelligence, decisiveness, knowledge, or job skills. Relationships are more important to good leadership than temperament, technique, or brain power. I have seen this truth more often displayed in the churches that I have been a part of for the last three decades. It is true. In fact, in our study today, the Apostle Paul illustrates this very same concept in his letter to the church in Thessalonica. So join me in that New Testament book, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Paul writes, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Paul begins here with a call to remember, to remember the things of the past that affected the present. What was it he wanted them to remember? Above all, he wanted them to remember the outcome of the message, that their coming to them was not in vain. The Greek word for vain means something that's empty, lacking purpose or earnestness. But Paul's visit, Paul's visit had purpose. It had meaning. It accomplished life change in these lost people. But it could have gone another way, quite easily. Help me. Paul and Silas came to Thessalonica from what city? It was Philippi. That's exactly right. Do you remember what happened to them in Philippi? Were they treated well? No, no. Despite the fact that Paul and Silas were both Roman citizens, they were publicly stripped, flogged, and thrown into jail without a trial. Oh my goodness, what a breach that was. Instead of pressing on to Thessalonica, Paul and Silas could have chosen to go back home with their wounds still throbbing. They could have felt unqualified, even defeated by the rejection of the Philippians and and the leaders there in the government. No one would have blamed them for taking a little break. But as you can see from what we just read, Paul wanted the Thessalonians to remember the boldness of the messengers, that even in the midst of violent opposition, they pressed on, preached boldly in Philippi and in Thessalonica as well. You see, 
Paul knew something that great leaders learn sooner or later. That disabilities, defeats, disappointments need not disqualify. That disabilities, defeats, disappointments need not disqualify. In fact, some of the best leaders come from a scarred past. Things like pain, suffering, mistakes, failures are the very things that can use that we can use or that God uses to bring about patience, perseverance, compassion, and hope, all of which are important ingredients to good leadership. But there are some, tra some traits that Paul wants us to avoid as a leader. So let's look at what it says in verses 3 through 6. Paul tells us there are four negatives that are common in leadership. And if we are to serve as leaders in our sphere of influence, we need to take note of these so that we can avoid them. Verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. The first trait that Paul exhorts us to avoid is being deceptive. Paul didn't come to town as the greatest show on earth. He was no charlatan. He wasn't trying to sweet talk people with half-truths and empty promises. Unfortunately, there were some in Paul's day and sadly some in our own day that use religion as a means for making money. But Paul had no ulterior motives. He spoke to the people with integrity and sincerity. He was, in my mind, a what-you-see-is-what-you-get kind of guy. No hidden agenda, no manipulation, no deception. The second negative trait is being a people pleaser. This may hurt I know I felt it as I studied this week. I don't want you to misunderstand anything about Paul. It doesn't mean that Paul went out of his way to offend people whenever he had a chance. But it does mean this. He didn't engage in deceitful flattery by skirting his principles to land a convert or by softening his message to avoid rejection. No. Listen, folks. Flattery and people-pleasing are signs of insecurity. Such people want to sit on the fence on certain issues, be liked by both sides, and tend to hold off making decisions until they see what the crowd decides. A flatterer is a person who manipulates instead of communicates. He can use either truth or lies to achieve his evil purpose, which is to control your decisions for his profit or his benefit. Paul tells us, in word or deed, his goal is to please God alone. In another of his letters, he wrote this, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul's approach needs to be ours. To do what's right before God and, folks, let people think what they want. The third undesirable trait for a leader is being greedy. Being greedy. With God as his witness, as Paul puts it, he swore that he and his associates had not preached for selfish gain. Greed isn't just the desire to have more. It's the desire to have more and more and more and more. 
when taken to extreme, greed becomes the driving force, listen, behind envy, jealousy, and covetousness. And it isn't just money and possessions that we are greed about, greedy about. We can be glory hogs. We want all of the recognition for our successes. Folks, people harbor greed about anything. Achievements, numbers, power and influence, fame. It goes on and on. We need to understand that only with the empowerment of God's spirit can we overwhelm this desire, this greed. And then it will result in the right motives done with the right leadership. Lastly, Paul warned against being an authoritarian. As an apostle, Paul had been handpicked by Christ. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do amazing miracles and recognized as an authority by many churches. Paul had the right to first-class treatment. Who doesn't like to be looked up to? Who doesn't like to be pampered and, and waited on? Who doesn't like to be recognized and held in high esteem? Abusing authority is a particularly powerful temptation for spiritual leaders. Why? Because people tend to put spiritual leaders on pedestals. This kind of authoritarian style can lead to rudeness, to a loss of accountability, and the use of dictatorial methods. Yes, even among Christian leaders. Paul reminded the Thessalonians that they knew how he came among them, that he didn't come seeking glory from men, nor did he play the apostle card. Paul's work among the Thessalonians shows us how we should lead within, our in, within those folks in our influence with humility, with honesty, transparency, and generosity. Having warned against some detrimental traits in leadership, Paul moves on to some positive traits that one will bring glory to God, but also will be a blessing to those who are served. Look at verse 7. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children. Paul and his companions, as you just saw, weren't weren't rough or insensitive to the Thessalonians. They were gentle, like a, a mother with her children. This is the first positive trait. They were need sensitive. There's nothing selfish about a mother's role. Instead, they are in a constant state of awareness, giving themselves over and over again to their children. We had our granddaughter with us last night. Oh my goodness. That little beggar can just drain the life out of you. And it was a reminder of motherhood and fatherhood too, but of all the attention you give to the children. You forget about that as we grow older. It was a good reminder for me to, to see this passage come to life here. In the same way, the Apostle Paul selflessly pledged himself to nourishing the people in Thessalonica with the word the food of God. He committed himself to understanding their hopes and their fears so he could meet their needs. He was need sensitive. Unlike some leaders who maintain a safe distance from those they serve, Paul didn't guard his personal space or seek to maintain a strictly professional relationship. Paul was all about loving people and providing for their needs, both spiritually and physically. That's the second positive trait. They had an affection for people. Paul cherished 
the Thessalonians. He loved them with a strong motherly love. They had affection for the people. Paul and his associates not only shared with the Thessalonians the truths of the gospel, but they lived out the gospel in their everyday lives too. And it didn't take long for the new Christians and the unbelievers to see their authentic and sincere way of life. That's the third trait. They lived an authentic lifestyle. Paul labored hard to live out the principles he was teaching among them. He knew that only leaders whose actions match their message have the power to influence people. They lived an authentic lifestyle. Now, if you're a parent or if you've ever coached a team, you will understand the importance of this final positive trait. Like a dad a mom or a coach, rooting for the kids or the players, Paul and his companions cheered on the members of this church. They exhibited enthusiastic affirmation. Paul's loving, fatherly encouragement urged them to press on, and did they ever need it? For we know that these people had been spiritually beaten up hassled and criticized by both the Jews in the city and the Gentiles. It would have been so easy for them to give in to the opposition, to go back to the way of life that they'd known before, but Paul's enthusiastic affirmation spurred them on to stay in the game, to finish what God had started. In verse 12, we see finally the goal of this kind of leadership. We exhorted, Paul says, each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What was Paul's objective? Well, folks, it's the very same today as it was then, to strengthen the Christian walk of those we're called to serve. To strengthen the Christian walk of those we're called to serve. Paul's leadership style focused on the benefit of those he served, that they might follow the Lord and enjoy his presence forever. Brothers and sisters, listen. Hearing or knowing these practical principles does nothing. But when they become a part of our daily lives as leaders, they can be beneficial, in fact, revolutionary. Paul's pattern of Christ-honoring and people-edifying spiritual leadership is the same, no matter the realm of your responsibility, whether it be a business, a church, a classroom, or a home. Folks, you may not think of yourself as a leader, but we all are. Let me help you understand that. If you're a Christian, you are a leader of everyone in your sphere of influence. Let me explain sphere of influence. That includes your family, your neighbors, people you work with or people you work for, your church, anyone you meet from the grocery store to the mall and everyone in between. When we allow, as Christians, God to lead us, others will follow. And you might be surprised just who's watching and what God does with how you lead your life. My friends, we all are leaders. Oh, how we need to hold on to that. I want to suggest three essentials, and we'll be done here in just a few moments, that will help us adopt a leadership style that works as we all lead. The first is develop spiritual security. Develop spiritual security. That means our strength and our motivation must come from Christ alone. For effective spiritual leadership, we need confidence in his calling. What is that? Confidence in his calling. We need to understand and accept and fully believe that we are his children. 
We have been called to be a part of his family. We need confidence in that. We need to have that firmly embraced. Secondly, we need assurance of his equipping, of God's equipping. That means we understand as Christians that we have been given spiritual gifts, gifts for the furtherance of his kingdom, not our kingdom, gifts that we use to help people, to help them understand who Christ is, but also to come alongside other Christians to help them grow as well. We need assurance of his equipping. And third, we need a conviction about his purpose and his goals. We've been given the Great Commission. Every one of us, not just pastors, not just people who have the gift of standing in front. We all have been given the Great Commission. That is his purpose. His goal for us is to be his ambassadors, to represent him wherever we are, with whomever we are. Isn't that a wonderful thing, folks? These things, these things will help us from becoming people pleasers. Why? Because our security will come from the spirit within, not from the crowd without. Develop spiritual security. Secondly, commit to excellence. Commit to excellence. We need to be committed to excellence in everything we do, no matter how hard it gets. Even if we are all alone in the pursuit, that commitment, my friends, could influence someone who's watching us. Someone who maybe will jump on the path with us. Ask God to show you his plan for leading that particular sphere of influence we all have. And then follow his plan with unwavering devotion and passion. And last, maintain a practical faith. Don't turn to God only after you've tried everything else. Anybody guilty of that one? Let's be honest. I got my hand up. We all do that at times. We all want to step in and say, oh God, I got this. No problem. I can fix this. And then something goes wrong, right? Don't turn to God only after you've tried everything else. We need to start with our faith. We need to take our first steps on our knees in prayer. Start with your faith. Take those first steps in prayer. Make a deliberate choice to make room for the living God in your life, putting Jesus Christ on the throne. Oh, that's where we fail sometimes, isn't it? We bounce Jesus out of the way and we kind of do our own thing and then when we really need him, we pull him back in. Isn't that true? Folks, when we put Jesus on the throne, that means exercising patience. That means exercising self-control and restraint. It also means that we give God room and time to act on our behalf. We are such a hurried people. We want it now, but that's not often how God works. He likes to teach us patience, but he also likes to teach us perseverance and long-sufferingness so that we can hang on no matter what the world sends our way. Give God room and time to act on our behalf. Brothers and sisters, with our hearts in focus, and our gaze set firmly on the goal of a godly walk, both for those that we serve and for ourselves as well, we can carry out Paul's positive, practical leadership in our lives. We can. We can be just like Paul with whomever we're with. The more I think about this, the more it is true. Our world needs godly influence. People who are willing to step into the fray. Our country needs godly influence. People who are willing to reach out and stand for truth. Our city needs godly influence. People who are willing to be known for positive values and godliness. Our neighborhoods need godly 
influence. And our homes need godly influence. Can we say that about our neighborhoods? Can we say that about our homes, that God reigns supreme? I can say it some of the time. But there are other times it's not true. We all need God's spirit to enable us to be that influence, to follow Paul's pattern here as we've seen this morning. Develop spiritual security, commit to excellence, and begin to maintain a practical faith. Father God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for Paul's example, both the good and the not so good. Because we learn from that. Inspire us, Lord, to be leaders with whomever, wherever we are. That people would see a practical godliness, a faith that is real and attractive. Oh, how we thank you, Lord, for your word. And how sometimes it's easy to take and other times it's a little hard to swallow, especially when it hits home. Speak to us here, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us? We're going to send you guys out this morning. It's a song we already did earlier. So you should be all warmed up, right? See you, we can't stay.